Good evening. Hello, welcome to UX and Data. So tonight you're gonna hear from Sarah Belt, who's the Director of Product Insights at Spotify. And she's leading a team of user researchers and data scientists that powers Spotify's product development for the artist and music industry community. So please welcome Sarah. And apologies, I, I think I'm gonna sit. I'm eight months and, and one week pregnant, so I might run out of breath if I don't sit. <laughs> and thank you for, for having me and, and welcome. Um, so thank you for the introduction. I think you covered half of the things that I was going to cover, but um, I'm a director of product insights at, at Spotify. I've been with the company for about four years. Um, and since this is a mostly research-oriented talk, I figured I'd introduce a little bit of my background and what my exposure to, to research is. And it helps probably put a lot of the talk in, into context. So I, um, I'm an industrial engineer, uh, went over to Darkside when I went to grad school for human computer interaction, and then permanently when I turned into a qualitative researcher from, from there. I did my um, formative years in research at, at Nokia. I was re really fortunate to, to do that. At that time, Nokia was one of the, one of the companies that had really the first, one of the first robust, large-scale research practices in, in the world, and a really sort of early on user-centered user um, design culture. Um, I did a lot of like hardcore usability work there, ergonomics, testing different types of keyboards for, for input accuracy and, and speed. Did a lot of cross-cultural research. Um, and, and found a lot of amazing research mentors through that um, experience. And then my, my next gig was at HERE, which is a uh, mapping company. And it was almost like an opposite experience to, um, to have as a researcher. I was a one-woman show, the only researcher in, in the US and build the, the humble research practice that they had um, from, from ground up. Um, from there, I moved on to Microsoft. I, I did research, uh, foundational research, into all things productivity and, and future of productivity, which was really cool and fun. Um, and at Spotify, my, my team um, cuts across to two very different disciplines that I think come together beautifully. Um, the, the data science practice and product analytics practice, as well as the user research practice. And I think it's a slightly unusual setup for a larger company to have. We don't have user research as, a, as its own organizational unit, so all of our user researchers sit within product insights, product insights teams. And the way my, my team likes to describe it is using this metaphor of solving crimes. Not 100% sure that I, I think it's a little suspect um, of a metaphor, but um, close enough. So you can think of data scientists as the sort of CSI and the forensics of, of crime solving, and, and, and then you can think of user research as the, as the investigators and the interrogators. And, and it's really hard to solve crimes without one or, one or the other. So this is a metaphor that we use quite a bit in, internally to describe the different superpowers that the different disciplines bring to the table. And the work that we do is focused on our artists and, and music industry audiences. Um, it's really, from Insight's perspective, quite a fascinating problem. We end up doing a lot of constant balancing and triangulation between the needs that the artists have and then between the uh, and then the listener side. So, if you think of um, some of these expression formats, for example, um, featured here that that we built within the creator team, they have both the they live in the listener experience. So, they have the component of um, seeking to introduce new artists to, to listeners or allowing um, listeners to learn more about their favorite artists. 
But then they have the artist component, and that's um, who it's also built for, who have the need to um, express and, and the desire to engage their, their fun, fans further. But that aside, um, we're here to, to talk about speed today. Um, and this is the, this is the structure of, of the talk. So I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about um, what got, got me thinking about speed of feedback loops. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the three different ways um, that, that you can speed up the, the feedback loops within product development. So making research itself faster, um, then stopping, stopping to think of research as a gate um, within product development, and then how you can more thoughtfully time research within an agile product development environment. I'm going to start with the pretty provocative statement. Um, product making with data, evidence, and empathy is pretty much a given in 2019. I don't know if that resonates with folks, if you, if you would agree. Um, based on my, my experience, I, I meet fewer and fewer people that question the, the value of data or question the value of evidence or, or even user centricity and user's voice and empathy. Um, within the creator R&D team, um, for example, which, which is where my team sits, um, roughly 10% of staff is inside. So 10% of, of staff is my team alone. That's a huge investment, and, and I think that that speaks to the value that, that people see in, in Insight's work. But then, then there's this other, other potentially provocative statement. Um, traditional methods of direct customer feedback are simply too slow, cumbersome, expensive, and unreliable. Customer feedback often fails to keep pace with the speed of business. Yikes. Um, slow, cumbersome, expensive, and, and unreliable. That makes me kind of question what, what sort of traditional methods this, this person is, is applying, but I think in all, in all honesty, this is a sentiment that I don't think is unique to her. I, I, think, it's, I think it's pretty commonly shared. And, and what got me thinking about this topic is we were, we were getting close to a pretty big product launch in, in my team, and one of my colleagues asked me this, this question. Why did it take us a year to ship this product? I mean, it was a significant launch, but it's not, it's not that large of a scope. Why, why was it so slow? We felt like everybody has a sense of urgency, everybody's working pretty hard, but still we, we seem to be shipping product pretty, pretty slowly. And I think it's a, it was a fair question. It was a wake up call for me. Um, and I think it, it, was a, it was a call to me to also um, start taking accountability for, for getting products to the market and for insights to contribute to that rather than to be the, the blocker or the, or the slowing force in the, in the process. So how can, how, can you, how can you do that? I think the first obvious way is to take a look at your research process and think about ways of, of making the research itself faster. There are a lot of tried and, and true methods that, that help, you, help you do this, so it doesn't require a ton of, of innovation. Um, first, you can, you can switch or um, replace some of your, your testing cycles. Uh, more traditional testing cycles with um, rapid iterative testing and evaluation methods. This is probably quite familiar to, to many of you, but essentially the idea is that instead of, instead of doing a test with five or 10 users and then analyzing that and writing a report and making recommendations and then reacting on those recommendations, you start making changes um, as quickly as after one participant. So you have the product team or a prototyper in the back room, and you're constantly iterating on, on the experience as you get feedback from, from users. 
Um, this is a really good, good method, I think, for evaluative research. Um, I think it truly does allow you to get to um, a solution faster. The, the issue that I take with it, which is why I wouldn't recommend making all of your uh, evaluative research rights, is that it doesn't really yield lasting learning. When you don't consistently test the same experience with your full sample of users, you can't really generalize the findings into, into themes. So the output of, of the research is the product. It's not, it's not knowledge. And, and it really is a pretty leaned-in experience, so it requires the product team to, to sit there through the research and, and make changes. So, so it is typically a, a bigger lift for, for the team than your traditional evaluative study. Um, then I would also recommend um, swapping some of your um, typical, uh, your traditional evaluative studies into guerrilla tests. Um, what is what usually takes most of the time of your of your research is participant recruitment. It can take five days. It can take even even a couple of weeks. Um, and the intent with guerrilla testing is that it it reduces that time to zero. So you go to a mall, you go to a, a subway station, or you go to a park, and, and you find your users, users there. And we do this quite a bit. This is a photo of, of one of our researchers doing, doing an intercept gorilla test in, in one of the parks in, in Flatiron, I think. And it really is good at cutting recruiting time. It also makes recruiting free, which it is not um, if you use a recruiting vendor. And, and it makes the, the sampling and sample sizing very flexible, so you can easily get 20, even 30 participants in a day. Um, the issues with it is that it only really works if you have a quite non-specific target users for, for your product. So we build products for the artist community. We don't do guerrilla testing in, in parks. Um, and it also doesn't work if, you're, if your product is confidential. You typically don't want to ask your intercept participant to sign an NDA. Um, and it can also lead to a biased sample, depending on, on where, you, where you end up doing this. Then probably a method that most, most people here are applying, but, but you can start um, design sprinting in your organization. It is really, what I like about it is that it's an innovation process that has all or, or most of the necessary ingredients. Um, just a little bit more speed and, and less depth. And, and this is something that we also frequently frequently do at, at Spotify. It's collaborative across disciplines. It is really an amazing opportunity to lock yourself in a room for an uninterrupted week with your cross-disciplinary peers and, and solve some problems. It also has um, a component of both generative research as well as evaluative research. So day one, you start with your target audience understanding, and, and then you end with, with the user test. For insights folks, this is a little bit challenging because it's kind of cheating to say that it's a five-day sprint when it assumes that on Monday you have results to um, report, so you definitely need to um, account for time to produce those foundational regenerative insights prior. Um, it also leaves you very little time to design robust research at the end of it. So it, the research itself ends up often, um, or the testing at the end ends up being a little bit scrappy. So, so those were all pretty standard um, textbook methods of running faster, faster research. What I find um, interesting is, is what I've seen um, some bigger companies too, in, including Spotify, and I think you don't need to have that scale in, in order to do this successfully, is introduce this idea of regular um, test days. And the, the basic concept is that for 
uh, on a weekly cadence or a biweekly cadence or a monthly cadence. You put a research session into the, the team's calendar for, for one day. You combine several different topics, so whatever the organization or team is working on, into, into a single session. And then you bring on your participants and they test three or four things within like an hour long session and boom, you've got, you've got quite a, a scale uh, of, of findings out of a, a single day of investment. At Spotify, we had a company-wide program that was like this. We called it uh, Soundcheck, and we ran it for, for about a couple of years. Um, and, and it was so successful that sound checking ended up being sort of synon synonymous to user research. So I still hear some of the product folks saying, like, oh, hey, could we sound check this? And, and it, became a, it, it became a brand in, in our organization. Also did it in my previous company at here. I know Microsoft and, and Google are both running processes like, like this. It really saves you on logistics when you um, combine several topics into a single session. It democratizes access to user research. So you can, if you have smaller topics, you can include teams or, or features that typically don't get the attention of, of user research. But in all honesty, it can be a little bit of a jarring experience, both for the researchers as well as for the test participants. When they come in and, and they're bombarded with, um, for example, three or, or four different, different topics. Then something I wanted to bring up that I've inv invested in quite a bit in, in my own team is creating a community of participants. And the idea is that you have pre-vetted, pre-NDA'd, um, pre-opted in set of participants um, that you can tap into with your research. And that saves you the, the five days or the two weeks that you would typically use for recruiting. And at its very simplest form, it can, it can just be a database of, of names. Um, in some companies, this takes the form of customer advisory board. It can also be an online, online platform where the members of the community interact with each other or even come together in, in a physical space for, for events. Um, and like I said, this is something that we've invested heavily in. It works for special audiences like, or VIP audiences like our, our artist community really well. Um, it saves the recruiting time and it really saves the wasted time that you would, um, you would have if you have what I call like dud participants. You, when you run research, you get a lot of no-show participants, or you get people who didn't necessarily truthfully answer your, your screener questions or aren't very articulate. Um, the risk with this is that, that you will get a biased sample. Typically, people who are leaned in and, and high engagement are likelier to participate in the communities, so you need to take that into, into account. And, and also, if you end up doing something that involves an interactive component, like a Facebook group, for example, for your community, um, do note that it takes a lot of time to manage that group to keep people, people engaged. Um, for example, in, in my team, it, it's gotten to the point where I have a community manager whose primary job it is to grow this community and, and maintain the community and, and keep, them, keep them engaged. And then a final thing for making your research faster is um, automating and standardizing and templatizing all parts of the research process that you possibly can imagine. So having a standard screener, having a library of questions, having a standard note-taking template, analysis templates, report templates. You, you really don't want to put yourself in a situation where you're every time rethinking, like, oh, should I use a five-point scale or a seven-point scale for this question? Or what should I include in my screener to 
ask sensitive questions about household income or, or things like that. You just want that to be templatized. Um, the pros of that are probably pretty obvious. You, you automate the things that, that are repeatable in, in your research process. And, and what I like about it too is um, you get more consistency and consistent quality for your insights work. You can have your most experienced person, for example, create some of these templates, and then less experienced folks can, can apply um, a lot of the, that learning. And I guess the, the only con would be that it doesn't work if, if you do a lot of non-custom custom research. So all that said, I think that the sort of routine research of generative interviews or, or user testing, it's a pretty optimized process. If, if you put these tools in your box and, and follow them, a study shouldn't take you longer than, than two weeks to run. The catch is, of course, that, that most research is, is not routine, and it does take time, and it, it should be given the, the time that it requires. I really love this um, quote from Joe Manco from, from Microsoft Research. When time constraints force us to drop the rigor and process that incorporates customer feedback, the user research you conduct loses, it, loses it, its val validity and ultimately its value. And what this is saying is once you've optimized your research process to a certain point, further optimization just means that you end up cutting corners and, and you end up creating research that, that no longer has value. And I, I always like to think that, you know, no research is better than, than bad research. Um, so beyond speeding up the process of researching, um, what can you do to um, speed up the feedback loops and, and the loop of learning within your organization? Um, stop treating research as a gate and be very thoughtful about how you time your research in, in an agile product development environment. Stop treating research as a gate or potentially a series of gates. Um, I think we do this quite often. We build, build gates in front of every milestone or, or every release and then Research is the rubber stamp that approves the progression to, to the next, um, next milestone, towards the next milestone. Um, I think this is because research has become so ubiquitous. Um, we've started to think of it as deterministic. Um, the beacon that, that clearly points out the, the direction that, that you should take your product to We've also started think, to think of it as um, a requirement that, that you must meet or a box that you must check um, for all decisions that you're about to make. We really shouldn't think about research as um, deterministic. It's not appropriate. Um, there's a quote that I like from Matt Gallivan here from Airbnb. UX research as a field, suffers from a deep sense of paranoia about not appearing scientific enough. The work is often fuzzy. It is subject to circumstance and nuance and influenced by phenomena that are difficult or impossible to measure. And I think we should just accept this, and it doesn't mean that research doesn't have value. We shouldn't think of it as having all of the answers. We should think of it as one input into the decision-making process. When you treat research as a, as a gate, it creates this culture of risk aversion, unnecessarily so, um, and really ends up slowing us down. Um, and, and from research researchers' perspective, what I re reflected on quite a bit is that it also leads us to run research that we shouldn't be running at all. It leads us to run research that has low validity, a research that isn't actually answering the questions that you're hoping it would answer. Um, it, it ends up 
um, in a place where we, where we run research for decisions that carry really low risk, or even sometimes are inevitable decisions. And it also ends up in a place where, where we stop to think about evidence and data more broadly and, and just force the, the research, user research as a, as a methodology or a set of methodologies to, to all, of our, all of our problems. So who's heard this or, or maybe even said this? Um, I, I have this amazing idea, can we go validate this idea? I really cringe a little bit when I, when I hear the idea of research as, as validation. Um, I don't think we, we should be approaching research like this ever um, for a couple of different reasons. Um, when you approach research as validation, it really opens your research design to confirmation bias. So when you go into, into a session or into a study with a validation mindset, it means that you're looking for evidence that will support your point of view or support the, the concept or product that, that you're evaluating. What you really should be doing is going into research, trying your very hardest to find evidence that disprove your, disprove your hypotheses. Um, also, Qual, qual research is a really weak um, hypothesis testing tool. I think validation implies that you're, you're going into research with the intention of, of affirming or disproving a hypothesis, but qualitative research is not the right tool to do that. Um, hypothesis testing is about increasing your confidence through testing um, with a larger and larger sample of people. Qual research by definition is not that. Um, qual research is excellent for hypothesis generation that you can then quantitatively test, um, as well as identifying risks in, in any interface or any concept that, that you're testing. Um, then there's another one. Um, can't decide which one is more, more common. Um, we're shipping next week, but we need to get this in front of users. Um, I don't think we should be wasting time to research, research what is already inevitable. Um, the, there, there are a set of questions here that me and my team have sort of brainstormed um, that we use to um, get alignment or gain alignment with, with our stakeholders. So like, let's really evaluate what the risk is associated with this decision. Um, what, what is the ROI on, on this piece of research? So number one, is this decision reversible? Um, I think it's less critical to study something that where the decision is very trivial to reverse. Um, do we have past research that we can use to gain confidence on this? And finally, do we have conviction that we're actually going to act on the findings? If not, then, then why do the research? And finally, I wanted to bring up uh, um, a problem that my team faces quite a bit. It is a really baller user research team, which means that both my own team as well as my stakeholders have started to look at every problem as a research problem. And there is a name to this cognitive bias. It's called Maslow's hammer. When, when you have a hammer, every problem starts to look like a, look like a nail. Um, which means that we end up running research that isn't really appropriate for, um, or end, end up doing research for, for topics that would be more appropriate for other methodologies of, of getting evidence. So what we've started to do is to really question, is this decision or a problem or research question really appropriate for qualitative research or should we be looking at testing at this at scale? And we end up using data science or product analytics to um, replace some of the research as well as make um, a lot of our research faster. So like I previously said, hypothesis testing is really something that we tend to do with data science methodologies. So experimentation, A-B testing at scale. And, and of course, this is to 
This is to say that we only do this when the decisions are easily reversible. So you shouldn't do this, <laughs> obviously, if, if it's something that is really hard to walk back, then you should attempt to, um, with user research methodologies, to, to test your hypothesis before launch. Um, and, and also, it applies to problems that or products that don't take forever to build. So if it's a, if it's a product that takes a year to build, I wouldn't recommend waiting on, on user research for, for a year. And we also use data science to help target and focus our, our qual research. So for example, we find segments of users that have interesting behaviors, which helps us target our recruitment or, or research questions such that we don't end up starting, starting with the blank slate when we, when we go to user research. All right, so you've made the research process itself faster. Um, and then you've stopped running all of the low validity research. Um, what else can you do is, is think about how you thoughtfully time your research in, in an agile product development environment. They're really, in my mind, and I'm, I'm not an agile expert, but this is, this is my understanding, um, there are two key beliefs or, or tenets to um, agile product development. Number one is um, problems should be broken down to their atomic units and then, then shipped, built and shipped. So, so typically agile teams operate by, by building, um, building, a, building a feature or solution to a user's story. Um, and then the other one is that working at, as a cross-disciplinary team Im improves the quality of the output. So if you look at your typical sprint team, um, scrum team, sorry, it would include all of the people that, that it takes to ship that product end to end. So it typically includes product, technology, design, and, and insights. I think both of these principles or, or tenets are, are really admirable. I don't disagree with either, either one of them. Um, but they do pose specific challenges for, for research that we should be mindful of. Number one, and, and potentially more importantly, user needs don't really align to an atomic unit of the experience or, or an interface. So when, when user interacts with, with the product, um, they don't interact with a single screen um, or even necessarily think of a single screen. They think of a larger um, user journey. Um, and then uh, from the diverse team perspective, it's really hard to say that there's any, anything wrong with that or any challenges related to this. Um, but what I've seen happen quite a bit is that when you uh, work in lockstep in a cross-disciplinary team, um, the designers and the engineers end up sitting on their hands waiting for, for research to be completed. Um, the atomic units problem often translates into, into these sorts of um, research questions. How about we go into a study and really understand the experience of this single screen? I actually mentored a, a young researcher some time ago whose job it was to, to understand the experience of a single screen. So organizationally, she was working in a large company. She was placed into a team that was on the hook for building a single screen and this researcher's scope was, was that screen. So why is that problematic? Why is narrowly focused research problematic? A couple of reasons. From speed perspective, as well as research quality perspective. It really exposes you to the query effect. So when you end up asking users to interact with or pay attention to, or comment on a really sort of atomic, tiny part of the interface, they will do that. They will do that and they will manufacture some sort of an opinion on it. Um, 
even if they they weren't thinking about that twice when they actually in real life interfaced with with your product. So so that obviously ends up creating um, results that that are false positives or or false negatives. Um, and from speed perspective, when you when your research is very narrowly focused like this, if most of it is tied to the scope of a single sprint. Um, you end up in a place as an organization where you don't accumulate knowledge and, and learning. All of your studies end up being disconnected from each other and not really aligned to a strategy or, or your product overall. Um, I like this quote from Lisa Reichelt on, on the query effect of narrowly focused research. Um, by focusing our research around a specific thing our team is responsible for, we increase our vulnerability to the query effect. That little feature is everything to the product team. And I also like this quote from, from Cho Manka again, um, talking about disposable versus lasting research. Disposable research is the stuff you throw away after you ship. To be truly lean, get rid of that wasteful process. Focus on making connections between past insights, then re hello, um, then reusing and remixing them in in new contexts. I really wholeheartedly believe in that idea that research teams should aspire to creation of of lasting knowledge. And then this is the this is the final theme that I wanted to introduce to you, and and it's potentially the most painful to to mention. Um, let's all work to work together in lockstep like the good partners that we are. And this is probably something that every insights person wanted to hear for a really long time. Insights is, I think, like five or ten years behind where, where design is and getting a seat at the table. And when you finally get that seat at the table, you don't want to say that, that you don't, don't want to be in that table. You do want to work in lockstep with um, with all of the other disciplines. But I think in order for you to create lasting knowledge, you, you do need to occasionally break away from that and, and carve out time to um, carve out time to be, be and think ahead of the product development team. And there are a couple of um, mechanisms that I've introduced to, to my team that, that help, us, help us do this. So first of all, every member of my team, um, I've asked them to think about their insights work in this dual track capacity. It's a lovely term because it aligns to the agile language. So it's very sort of understandable across all of the, the disciplines in, in the team. But there's the foundational track and there's the shipping track of, of of insights work. On the foundational track, um, all of my insights folks are working on pieces of work that add to our organization's knowledge base, or they're developing new methodologies, or they're developing new systems that we know we will need in a quarter's time or a six months time. While, while they do that, within an, any given quarter, they also work on a shipping track. And this means that you work as part of a cross-disciplinary team in any capacity that is required for you to produce the evidence that, that helps that team ship good quality product. And another mechanism we use is um, what I call learning OKRs. OKRs means objectives and key results, and it's one tool for, for planning product development work that, that we use within the creator R&D team at Spotify. Um, and what OKRs typically are is, is very sort of delivery or, or metrics oriented goals for the product team. The product team sets them for themselves um, and, and typically the expectation is that you'll hit somewhere between 70 to 100% of your delivery goals on, a, on any given quarter. And what we've started to do is introduce into that mix um, learning objectives in addition to delivery objectives. And this is a vehicle through which we have a very tough negotiation with our 
stakeholders in product tech and, and design to, to talk about what is the learning that we want to invest in and need to invest in um, so that we can hit not only our quarterly goals but the goals of the following, following quarter and, and the year. And, and this really is the mindset of treating your insights work and, and treating your learning the same way you would treat your investment in a technology platform, for example. So everybody, everybody knows that, especially if you're in the, the startup environment, sometimes you just gotta hustle and ship something that's a little bit hacky. Sometimes you do that with research as well. Um, but longer term, in order for you to move fast, you wanna invest in in an insights platform or in like an, a, a platform of, of knowledge in, to, in addition to you investing in, in your um, tech and product platforms. All right, that's all the themes and, and let's, now, let's now recap what the recipe for, for speed is in, in product development. Um, you should be making your research faster. Use the, the tools in the box that are well understood and known. Um, rapid iterative testing and evaluation, guerrilla testing, um, design sprints. Think about introducing a regular testing day into your, your team's rituals. Um, consider building a participant community um, that allows you to tap pre-vetted participants, and automate all the parts that are standard about your research process. Once you've done that, um, bring about a cultural change uh, where you stop thinking of research as a box to check or a gate to open or pass. Stop validation, stop low ROI research, and, and consider if there are alternatives to user testing, for example, in, in the experimentation or, or product analytics toolkit. And finally, think about ways for, for you to operate in an agile environment in a way that doesn't compromise the research quality or speed. Um, avoid um, hyper-focused or narrow, narrowly focused research. Um, invest in off-the-shelf insights in an insights platform, and occasionally work ahead of your partners um, in your cross-disciplinary team. Thank you. So we have some time for questions, and you just wait for the mic. We have this fun little mic here for questions, so start here. Hi, thank you. <laughs> thank you, I really enjoyed it. I'm really glad that I came. Um, you talk about insights having a seat at the table. Um, I have a lot of questions that I jotted down, but one that I'm personally struggling with right now is, do you find your insights team having a seat at the um, investment and strategic planning table in that the insights that your team is generating are affecting not just um, the products and experiences that you're building, but also shaping strategy for 2020 and, and years to come. Um, and so that would be question one and sort of a, a sub question under that would be um, something that I struggle with in that realm is competing against other priorities that are more easily quantifiable in terms of ROI. And so if you're arguing for improving the experience in some way, um, and you get, do you have sort of a, a way to quantify the return on, on that improvement as a part of those discussions? Well, to answer your first question, I think that we are now there in terms of having a, a seat at the table for 2020 planning and, and strategy. I can't claim that it's always been like that, so it is definitely a, a journey. Um, Having worked as the sole researcher a couple of, couple of jobs ago, I, I completely 
empathize with, with the situation where you really need to advocate for the work and, and wait for that recognition and, and influence to be granted to you to, to some extent. Um, but I think it is about building building trust with your with your partners in product tech and design, and I think you do that by by starting small, by starting showing value, um, not being very lab codey or and and understanding the values that that the other disciplines care about, like shipping, speed of shipping, and and aligning on that, um, and. And showing value gradually, I think, allows you more leeway to do bigger scope things, allows you to find your allies. And my ally was our um, head of design, who who then began to advocate for, for insights to to have a seat at the table. And I think that is that is what the journey journey looked like for for my team. Um, then, sorry, uh, your other question was around. Do you have a way of, uh, of quantifying. quantifying improvements to the user experience, be it artist or uh, otherwise? Um, I think that a carefully created metrics framework should account for for that as well. It's a little bit of a cop-out answer if you don't happen to be the person who also owns the creation of the metrics framework like I do. Um, but aligning again with your analytics team um, and if, if you're not in the same team with that, um, as well as your product team who tends to be the, the folks that set metrics um, on and how those metrics capture capture user experience, and whether it's something that you measure directly, or whether it's something that you trust will have a will be predictive of of a, a top line metric like revenue, um, then depends on depends on your business. But I I think that a top line metric like retention or active users. It's really hard to achieve any of those metrics with poor poor user experience. So I think that is the that is the way to frequently quantify it, even if you don't have a user experience metric on your main dashboard. Thank you. Hello, that was a great talk. Um, my name is Keisha, and I'm transitioning from more of an operations and media role to a data analytics role. And so I decided to do some research on my own to try to build a portfolio. And one of the questions I have is around like the guerrilla research and going and talking to people. So I've been doing a few surveys. My question is on sampling. How do you incorporate social into these different research processes or programs you're running? Like, I did a survey and I sent some out through LinkedIn, then I had my friends retweet it on Twitter, and you're not quite sure about the sample you're getting. So I just wanted to wanted you to talk a bit about how you apply these processes to social in a way that a single person could possibly do it too. Thank you. I think it is a, is a little bit Tricky, I think, when I when I think about the way we do sampling for our surveys is two ways. So we do intercept intercept surveys, um, which is only obviously available if you're an in-house researcher. So we would um, we would trigger a little pop-up either on one of our web properties or either on the Spotify web client and, and survey people through that. Or we would send an email survey um, to a sample that we obviously control um, because we have access to the, to the user data. So we don't typically do a ton of recruiting of, of respondents through, um, through social platforms. But it sounds like you are already recognizing quite a bit the, the bias or, or sort of insecurity that that um, uh, introduces into your research setup. But what I would recommend is asking, asking screener questions as part of your survey, which is always if you, don't, if you have an anonymous survey and you don't really know who, who is taking it, um, you can control that a little bit by adding questions, demographic questions or whatever other other questions happen to be, be your screening criteria into the survey itself. Okay. 
Thank you. Thanks again for a great talk. Uh, so my question is around uh, the process with Agile. So you mentioned a couple of the issues that are happening. And I would like to hear from you best practices and what are your tips for creating a successful Agile process for everyone, including research? Um, that's a good question. I don't know that we have completely nailed it. Um, and, and the one key sort of crux of debate that we end up having with my team is, are we an embe fully embedded team? Do we have data scientists and user researchers embed with the Scrum teams forever and ever? Or do we operate in a more sort of central capacity and like go in and out of, um, of, the, of the sprint schedule, so to speak? And I, I don't think that there's like, one way is absolutely better than, than the other way, but what we've ended up doing is any feature that has a significant scope that is actually meaningful from user's perspective, um, we would typically have a researcher embed with that team through the entire process of bringing that, that product to, to market. So then, as a researcher, you end up doing your shipping track work and you end up doing your foundational work, but you're always assigned to, to that group and you participate in their stand-up and in their rhythms and rituals and have those relationships. Um, and, and then you just make the conscious decision of you're gonna have 50% or 70% of your scrum teams without any research uh, su support, and then you have the ones that you truly um, feel are most strategic that, that get the full attention of, of researchers. And I think that ends up, as a researcher, being a more satisfying experience um, to, to work in as well. So we try to cater to that with planning, planning the research ahead of time. So anything that would block the team, we we tend to do, um, tend to do as part of our foundational track or, or earlier on. But obviously, it isn't always possible. So so if you go into a design sprint, for example, and the output of that process is a concept, you can't really start running research on that concept before that that sprint is is done. So, so then I think rather than sitting on your hands, the, the better option is to either actively participate in the research. We see a lot of our designers, product folks, engineers um, being active participants in the field work as well as in the analysis. Um, and then what I also tell folks to, to do often is don't treat research as a gate. You should pursue your development work on a parallel track, and then we can we can change directions or course correct if we learn from research that we weren't doing the right thing, rather than you waiting and and then proceeding to continue the development work after the results are in. That's a great idea. Yeah. Thank Thanks so much for the talk. Uh, I love your point about uh, avoiding low ROI research. I was curious if you could share just some attributes of high ROI research and possibly if you could share an example from your career at Spotify or previously that demonstrate those attributes. I'm trying to think of something that isn't very confidential, but I think the one of the key tenets is when when the product that you, when it's not what we call like a revolving door decision, when it's a decision that you can't really walk back, I think that is when you end up doing a lot of high ROI research. So let me think hypothetically, um, let's say you wanted to, um, let uh, introduce a, paid tier to a previously, oh, thank you, to a previously free product, for example. The price of that would be set in stone to some extent by, by you doing the release. So, so that would be a decision that's really hard to, hard to reverse. 
um, as well as if you end up sort of disappointing or shocking your users by doing that. So doing research ahead of time on a feature like that would be really high ROI. Um, I also think that investments in knowledge end up being high ROI, so, so that is foundational pieces of research. The immediate response from the organization will often be, well, where's the more actionable list of things that you learned from, from this research? But if you end up being in the same company for a year or for two years, you will notice that those will be the pieces of research that get, get referenced over and over and over again. I still get Google, Google slide pings, comments on documents that we created three years ago. Um, and those are always the most foundational pieces of research. We, we did a research on artist creative process, or we did a target audience study to understand their, their jobs to be done. And those reusable frameworks end up just being endlessly, endlessly um, sort of reused. Hello, hello. All right, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm wondering if you could share some examples of your learning O's and KRs for us. Um, this, this trimester, I didn't want to confuse anybody during the doc talking about um, trimesters, but instead of quarters, we're in a trimesterly <laughs> um, planning cadence. And this trimester, we have a learning objective um, around redefining our target audience framework. So we've created in the past, we've created a needs map um, and a jobs to be done framework that I mentioned. And, and I feel that with the strategy having evolved the way it has, that's, that feels a little bit outdated. So we're gonna do a foundational project to really crisp in our target audience definition. So that's a foundational project. We have another foundational um, research project, which is a learning objective around um, creating a playbook for experimentation of, of marketplace experiences. So um, like I was alluding to in the beginning, a lot of the experiences that we create end up having a touch point with the artist as well as with the listener. And methodologically, that is very um, tricky for, for A-B testing and experimentation. So creating a best practices template and a standard is, is one of our learning, learning O's, and it goes more into the sort of methodology category. Um, okay, so I had a question about maybe how your team disseminates information. How do you guys, you talked about accumulated knowledge, talked about people, you know, asking for information that goes three years back. So how do you take your team and how do you, how do you all um, organize your information as you continue collecting it? And do you allow other people outside of the team to dig into this, you know, this pile of information, or is it, is it you guys that kind of navigate it? What kind of tools do you use? Confluence, Dex, I don't know, so. Yeah, it's, uh, I think that question or dilemma has existed as long as I've been doing research on like what is the best way to organize knowledge such, such that it becomes reusable. Um, we do communication, so the way we communicate out research is, you do that with your, with your scrum team, typically through osmosis, they participate in your research. Beyond that, you organize a bespoke debrief on a sort of level, level higher at the organization. And then at the sort of company and organization level, we send out monthly newsletters and we do a monthly inside share for our entire um, organization where we do 10 minute um, insights presentations. The information is stored, so we use the, the Google, Google system, so um, all of our um, reports are Google Slides or Google Docs, and they're really searchable and accessible by, by anybody, so the access is very democratized um, for reports. Um, we also have an in-house um, Insights Foundations team who has built a bespoke Spotify platform for searching um, searching insights reports that are tagged with appropriate tags. 
Um, and then when you think about the analysis uh, or more like raw data, um, we use Airtable for our research analysis and that is something that we share across um, all of the researchers, um, being mindful of GDPR, of course. Um, and, and we also do the same with our research transcripts. So we have all of our research sessions transcribed um, and the researchers themselves have, have access to, to those. So those are some of the, the ways that, that we do that. But the way you sort of make it easily accessible and consumable to an organization, it, let me know if you, if you find out how to, how to really do that successfully. It's a really hard problem. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so I used to work in a very big um, a user research group uh, as a user researcher, but now I'm a one-person one UX team. Um, so I work with a lot of learning scientists and language education, um, education people and scientists also. And most of them, it's their first time working with a UX person. Um, and I really wanted to advocate for myself, so I do one-on-one -on -one meetings with them. I organize team-wide, like 20 people, uh, ideation sessions, and then every time they bring up something like a survey or like a interview, I think of it as a UX question. So it's really hard for me to draw boundaries between what's the time for me, what's the time for the team, because I want them to trust me. So do you have any suggestions for that? You mean specifically on sort of time management or drawing boundaries? Yeah, yeah it's tough. I feel like um, researchers, like not un until not so long ago, I think we had to sell the value of of research to all of all of the organizations that we worked in, which led to a situation where. If there's any appetite at all, you do anything you can to cater to cater to that appetite, which then personally becomes un, unmanageable. Um, so I would I would suggest just radical focus of instead of trying to capture, for example, your entire team or your entire organization, Focus on whatever product or whatever team is working on the most mission critical, most strategic, most metrics moving um, project, and provide all of your all of your support to that team. Um, it's been my experience that it's better to provide excellent insights work or excellent work overall to one area and starve all the other areas, rather than trying to give a little little bit of something for everybody and not really doing work that is comprehensive or that you can be proud of um, for your portfolio or for the company. So I think the way to generate demand is to do the work really well in, small, in a small part of the, the organization. Hi. Thank, thanks again. This was very um, uh, interesting and compelling. I, I just had a question about, you were talking about sound check, and it sounded like it ended. Do you mind just talking a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, it's a program that we ran, I think, for about two years, and, and it was one of the toughest things that we did as an insights community to um, retire. We, we retired that program. Um, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, our company got to the scale where we felt like the research questions that were posed or submitted for the soundcheck process ended up being so divergent that it was really impossible for a researcher to have the appropriate context on all of the, all of the questions that got submitted. It often ended up being similar to the, from the participant recruiting perspective. If you get a question of, oh, Spotify in the car, and then you get a question of, oh, premium listeners, this and that, and then you get some markets-related question, it doesn't really lend itself well when you would need to do a specific recruit for each of them. Um, and then, then in all honesty, I think it can become an exhausting job for a researcher if you're assigned to run a recurring research 
um, process, and that's your only job. So I think you need to staff it in a way where it's like a rotating, rotating responsibility or, or something like that. So what we've since then ended up doing is implement team-specific processes. I know that on our ad product side, they have what they call Tested Tuesdays, which is the, the same concept. It's just not a company-wide process. Thanks. Um, like you said about um, validating hypotheses, not through qualitative research, but quantitative. Um, have you noticed any downsides or is there anything that you've learned um, potentially from biases in having two teams or two different types of research maybe working on the same types of questions? I'm trying to think of an example of a bias because I think it's often ends up being the opposite of of a bias when you have a user researcher and a data scientist collaborating on a, on a project. So what recently, maybe I can talk through this uh, with an example. So recently we released a, a new experience that lived within the Spotify consumer product. And, and we noticed, even though we had generated the concept through co-creation methodologies with users, we noticed an, an unexpected dip in, in some of our key metrics on the consumer side, and we were really confused because we had used appropriate generative research methodologies, and, and yet the, the hypothesis that we have that this would increase some of our um, top line metrics ended up um, not panning out. And, and what we discovered is that it, were, it was actually very specific user groups with um, sort of older generation phones facing performance problems where the feature wouldn't render well, um, as well as very sort of um, specific segments of engagement that were impacted by, that sort of, that were negatively impacted by this experience or perceived it in a negative way, and then that caused a dip in all of our all of our metrics. So that was something that we only learned because we did this at at scale, and 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 it doesn't mean that the research wasn't valid that we did in terms of co-creation. It means that it just wasn't comprehensive of all of our all of our user groups. So how, how would you prevent that the next time? Or what did you learn from that in terms of altering the research process, maybe? I think that we would probably include some sort of quantitative um, quantitative user research component, like a survey to it. Um, but but I think it the process in this case worked pretty well. I think it worked the way it was supposed to. We didn't go and release the product to 100% of our users. We released it to 1% of our users. And we've been iterating since then. Um, and we've been following up on some of the more unintuitive results that we're seeing in A-B testing through further, further user research. Thanks for the talk. Um, so right now I'm uh, currently on a pretty young design team and uh, we primarily rely on qualitative research. And we keep hearing about like using, utilizing data to like tell a better story or to validate. Um, however, we're not really too sure how to foster that relationship with the data scientists at our company. I'm just wondering if you have any advice for uh, like a young design team how to like where to start and how to foster that strong relationship that it seems like you guys have between research and data? It's such a good question because I think um, a lot of that for Spotify specifically, in, in all honesty, what came to be because we, as leaders, decided to um, merge the teams. So it was less voluntary, if you will, and it was because we were, we started going to the same team meetings and we started um, being managed by the, by the same people. I think that sort of forces the process of, of learning about each other's um, work. But, but again, I would recommend doing that rather than doing it on a level of, 
of principles or try to set process immediately, I would suggest doing that through a case study. So instead of approaching approaching analytics or data science team in terms of like, oh, how, how do you think we should work together? Um, rather asking for their collaboration on a specific problem or a project that, that you're working on. I think that's when it really clicks with people, when, when you actually work together, rather than try to sort of abstractly theorize how you, how you might work together in, in the future. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. Can we give her another round of applause? <laughs>